2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to read a very familiar passage, verses 1 through 10. I will read verse 1 and ask you to join me on verse 2 and every other verse down through verse number 10. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire the glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but that now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the, measure, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. We are continuing in our current series, if you want to call it that, on Sunday morning, answering the questions, what if? And this morning we want to concentrate on this little passage here that's very famous. Most folks know a good deal of what it says and have memorized a good portion of it. And we're going to answer the question this morning in a different way of what is grace? What is grace? Father, bless now, I pray, the preaching of your word. There's something here that all of us need. And I pray, dear God, that you'd give us that wherewithal today. All I ask is that you use me again. If this is the last service that any of us ever get to attend, we want it to be for your honor and glory. And I ask you, Heavenly Father, to meet with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. What is grace? I know what some of you have already thought. He said, back in May, uh, in our doctrinal study of the book of Philippians, we looked at grace. And uh, from the perspective of how it was used in that little short epistle. And as we went through the book of Philippians, we did a doctrinal study of that great book. And we found, I think, we ended up with over 50, 51 lessons and it came out of the book of Philippians alone. One of those was on grace. But this is not a repeat of that Bible study, and I want you to know that. What we're going to do is we're going to see grace in a different perspective, answering the question, what is grace? Grace is a number of things, and it does not matter how many sermons. It does not matter how many lessons. It does not matter how many lectures. It does not matter how many books are written on the subject. It is my opinion that you can never exhaust the subject of grace. It's just an impossibility. And uh, as a grace preaching church, which we are, and we're even listed in grace uh, publications that we are a grace preaching church and a grace uh, teaching church, a grace kind of church. And so uh, as a grace preaching church, the subject of grace has been preached here many times over the last nearly three and a half decades. When you think about that, 33 and a half years, if you're a grace preacher, and I don't mean a graceful preacher, I'm far from being a graceful preacher, that's for sure. But if you're a grace preaching preacher, or if you're a grace believing church, uh, you're not going to only occasionally mention grace because grace is what we believe. And over these three and a half decades of preaching, Grace has been a major topic throughout all of these years. And we, uh, what we're going to do today, this message, it will simply be another attempt. 
at uncovering one of the many facets of the word grace in the Bible. Uh, though I'll give you this verse in just a little while, the Bible talks about the manifold grace of God. And the little word manifold that is there describes a diamond ring or a ring like I have on that the church family gave me many years ago with this beautiful garnet in it. It has facets that are cut into it. Uh, a 19 cent big pin has the same characteristic that has the little facets cut into the barrel of that pin. It reflects light in different colors and things like that. And uh, again, this is not my message for today, but we're going to look at some of the facets of grace, which are very, very important. If you were to take your faceted diamond ring or your, uh, like I'll take my uh, little garnet ring that has, by the way, six little diamonds in it uh, that the church family gave us a number of years ago, and you were to hold it up to where you could see it, you'd see that it, or your diamond, or your emerald, or whatever it might be, you'd see many colors in it. That's the way it is. And so when the Bible says the manifold grace of God, it means that God's got many kinds of grace for every kind of situation in our lives. Of course, now, uh, the truth is, it is by grace through which we are saved. The Bible plainly states that. And a lot of what I'm going to say today, there is just not a question mark about it. There can't be a question mark about it. I mean, when it says something, it means what it says and says what it means, and there's just not a variation. For example, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, most everyone in this room know those verses of Scripture by heart, don't you? And I know you do, and you're welcome to mouth it, or you're welcome. I was watching a video this week of some young people singing, and as one person was singing a solo, another one of the young people was mouthing all the words and not singing with them, but they were mouthing the words. And if you know the words, go ahead and say them, uh, but for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And faith is not the gift. Salvation is the gift. As the Bible simply says, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we have learned the New Testament word translated as grace comes from a little Greek word. It's the word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. Someone has a charismatic personality or they might go to a particular denomination that is a charismatic denomination. The word means gift. If someone is a charismatic speaker, that means he is a gifted speaker. He's able to communicate well. And so the little word grace comes from that little word charis, which means gift, and that is what it means. And in salvation, sadly, the word grace has been misunderstood. Uh, we know and believe the word of God assures us that salvation is, as my pastor taught me when I was just a little boy, that grace is the unmerited favor of God. This guy has lots and lots of definitions that people have given it. God's riches at Christ's expense. There's just so many things that have been said about grace. But my pastor taught me when I was a little boy, uh, he simply said it's the unmerited or undeserved favor of God. And that is what grace is to each of us in our lives when we think about that. And uh, by the way, the word of God is very clear on this, that we are saved by grace through faith. We're not saved through works. We're not saved through that water tank behind me. We're not saved through anything like that. We are saved by grace through faith. And the Bible makes no bones about it and makes no exceptions to it. Let me give you the verses that I've written down. Ephesians 2, 9, uh, not of, where it says, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. There's not a good thing you can do that, or that I can do to cause us to deserve or merit in any way God's gift of salvation. You can be as good as you want to a person who go to hell if he's never trusted Christ, if all he's done is good works all of his life, because good works will get you there. It's just not that way. Romans 4, 5, the apostle Paul writes and says, uh, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, the word of God says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, probably the one verse 
in many churches that has been completely removed out of their Bibles, not because it's not printed there, but because they don't believe it, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. That's interesting. Let me just read the whole thing to you. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Person can, person can keep the more than 600 points of the law found in the Old Testament if they want to. Not a one of them will prepare you for heaven because the law was never given to save you. The law was given to show you your need of a savior, to show us that we can't stack up. And then, of course, there is Romans 3, verses 21 and 22. The Bible says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, there is where the word of God says, therefore being justified by what? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, there's Romans 6, 23, the one that everybody knows by heart. The gift of God is eternal life through membership in Timberline Baptist Church. Now, wait a minute. I think I read that wrong. It says the gift of God is eternal life through righteous living. Now, by the way, I believe in membership at Timberline Baptist Church, and I believe in righteous living. But the Bible doesn't say salvation is any of those things or that the gift of God is eternal life through any of them. It simply says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All that to say, the Bible is absolutely clear. On the list goes, if I would have listed every verse that I know that I could have put here, we would be here for a very long time this morning. We are saved by grace through faith and that's it. However, there are some, and this is before I get to the meat of my message, and I realize that what I'm about to say would be offensive to some. No one in this room, not a single person in this room, would be offended by it, I know. Maybe some listening online, but probably not. Our friends that are online with us right now believe pretty much the way that we do here. But there are some who take this gift of grace to an unbiblical extreme by simply saying that God chooses some for salvation by his grace, and they have no say in the matter. It has been called irresistible grace, simply meaning you can't say no if God has chosen you to be saved. When I read my Bible, I don't find that in Scripture. I find that in some books, but I don't find it in a single book in the Bible. I find it out of context in the Bible, I find misapplication of it in the Bible, but I don't find it as a doctrine in the Bible. And when I say that, the Bible talks about false doctrine. It talks about, it talks about healthy doctrine, which is called sound doctrine. And when you have healthy doctrine, you have healthy Christian living. God's word indicates differently and that God has in his sovereignty given us a choice about salvation. Let me just give you the verses. Some, well, I tell you, I made it a goal many years ago that I wanted my mind to be like a, um, I wanted it to be like a concordance in many ways to where if I think of one verse, it'll take me to another one. I don't have to always be thumbing through my Bible trying to find a verse that fits. And many years ago, I started memorizing scripture through a program that I found for $9.95 in a Christian bookstore that bases right here in Colorado Springs. And, uh, and it was called the Topical Scripture Memory System. It cost me 10 bucks at First Baptist Church of Rosemont. I was a college student, freshman year in Minnesota. I bought it, and it in there it had little cards by categories, topics. And you could memorize uh, scores of verses in a particular topic. 
And I thought, that's about the best way I can think of, other than scripture songs, to memorize scriptures, to learn by topic. Like, uh, for example, how many verses can you quote by, on salvation by grace? How many verses can you quote on baptism? How many verses can you quote on any subject given in the Bible? Well, I found that to be a very profitable thing for me. And so when I give you these verses, these are this is a, is speckling the right word? This is just a, it's just a few of what I believe about a man having a choice in salvation. John 1, 12. The Bible says, let me just give you the verses before that, verses 10 through 12. He was in the world. The world was made by him. The world knew him not. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Ladies and gentlemen, that speaks of choice. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That speaks of choice. John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come unto condemnation but is passed from death unto life that speaks of choice romans ten thirteen. for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved that speaks of choice john the baptist's own words in john three thirty six, where the bible says he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abideth on him that speaks of choice first john 5 verses 11 through 13 and this is the record that god hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son he that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son of god hath not life it's interesting these things have i written unto you that believe on the name of the son of god that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the son of god that passage speaks of choice and then one nobody goes to. Why not? Revelation 22 and verse 17, where it says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, that whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That speaks of choice. And I gave you just a smattering, a spackling of verses that talk about our choice, where God gives us the choice to choose whether or not we want to be saved. It's not a matter of God choosing you to be saved. The Bible tells us very plainly that Jesus gave his life to ransom all, the Bible says. He wants everybody to be saved, and whosoever means exactly that. And by the way, to top it off, to top it off, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, you know it by heart. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish but that all should come unto repentance. God's pretty clear on it. He, he wants everybody to get saved. Isn't that right, Paul? He wants everybody to get saved. He wants everybody to trust the Lord as a Savior. That's why Jesus came. He didn't come for a, a few. He came for all, the Bible says. And so scripture, listen, in that God is not willing that any should perish, he gives us the choice to not perish by obeying the gospel, by believing in Jesus as our Savior. And by the way, before I get to the meat of my message today, Scripture makes it abundantly clear that salvation is a gift freely given and paid for by the shed blood of the Son of God. And we are given a choice in the matter to obey, hear me now, because the wording in the Word of God is clear, to obey or disobey the gospel. See, you mean there's something we have to do to be saved? We have to obey something? I'm so glad you asked because nobody ever preaches on these things anymore. But the Bible says, for example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to obey the gospel? Some kind of a work? Some, no, we've already established that it's not by a work of righteousness. So what is it? First Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Everybody preaches on that. 
And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Wow, pastor, I've never heard those verses before. Oh, you have. But they did what my mom and dad said. Goes in one ear and out the other. What does it mean to obey the gospel? All that to say that grace has been misunderstood and abused by many. So what does it mean to obey the gospel? The Bible tells us very plainly, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's obedient to what God wants us to do. He gives us the choice to choose not to perish by simply calling upon the name of the Lord. I read something that someone wrote the other day. It disappointed my heart terribly. He said, Romans 10, 13 needs to be taken out of scripture, just completely erased. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I thought, really? I guess we got to go back to Joel and take it out there too. And a number of other places in the word of God, obeying the gospel is doing what God says it takes to be saved. And by the way, don't you remember those fellows that were in jail in Acts and uh, uh, the, they, they were singing and, and all that all the way through midnight and, a, and an earthquake came and shook the place down and freed all the prisoners, but they stayed put. Don't you remember what the guards said to them? said, sirs, what must I do to keep them from killing me with an 18-inch sword because they're all the prisoners have escaped? (laughs) That's basically what he said. And they said, no, we're all still here. Nobody's left. We're all still here. But they took the opportunity to say this. I'll tell you what you have to do to be saved. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Acts 16, verses 30 and 31. That's called obeying the gospel. End of report. Now, all that does bring us to the meat of my message today. Grace has been misunderstood and I personally believe abused by many. So what is grace? Did you know that Noah is the first person in the Bible where grace is used? The Bible says in, uh, it says that he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis chapter six and verse eight. And the very last time that grace is found in the Bible is in Revelation 22 and verse 21, where it says, but the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. It's literally a gift. It's what God grants to, to us to do this. What is grace? It's what God grants to us in order to accomplish his will. For example, we have a tract called God's Simple Plan of Salvation. He's provided for us how to be saved. You see, if he says in 1 John 5, 13, that we can know for sure, as it says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, then somewhere in the Bible, it must tell us how to know. God did not leave us without instruction. And so we have here, that grace, where God gives us the ability or gives us the wherewithal to accomplish his will. And it's his will that you get saved. So he accomplished that by giving us the means, Jesus Christ. And in that grace is literally a gift. It is what God grants to us in order to accomplish his will in our lives, the power of God to do the will of God. For example, there are many ways in which God manifests his grace. I mentioned this verse a while ago. I'm not going to preach on it, but I'm going to read it to you. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, as many as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, the many kinds of the grace of God, not just getting someone saved, but listen, we need grace to do all kinds of things. And so what I want to give you the meat of my message today is four very simple points about the apostle Paul. And I think that these facets of God's will and of of God's grace are what every one of us needs. You may not need all of it right now, but all of us are going to need all of it sometime. I think, first of all, very simply, of course, Paul had saving grace. In Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, he had saving grace. And he trusted the Lord as a savior, gave his testimony throughout the book of Acts. God used him in a wonderful and a mighty way, but he had that initial point in his life where he got born again. He had saving grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. But then notice secondly, that he had living grace. 
Oh, but pastor, the Christian life is so hard. It's so difficult to live the Christian life. The Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard, not the way of the believer. Let me read you something here in Philippians 1, verses 20 and 21. It simply says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die as gain. He had living grace. Paul went through hard times, but he made it by God's grace. The verses that we read at the beginning of this message in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, he makes a very plain statement. He said, God gave me a thorn in my flesh, something wrong with me. Many believe it was an eye problem that he had, ophthalmia or something along those lines, where the swelling and the pus and the infection and all that. And at one point, he's even wrote about how he had to write a letter under the inspiration of the Spirit, in large letters, because he had to be able to see them. I'm always reminded of Billy Sunday when I read that, how Billy Sunday, when he wrote out his sermon outlines, because Billy would walk back and forth on the platform of where he was preaching, and he had to write in big letters so that when he would walk past the, the sacred desk there, so to speak, he would be able to see his outline written in big letters. By the way, so that I can read, and sometimes I mess up, I have my scriptures written out in large letters too, so that I can actually see them rather than the little ten point or ten pitch that's in my Bible. Well, I, when I think about this, I think about where he said, God, he said, there was this thorn given to me in the flesh. Can you imagine a preacher without his eyesight? When I was in Bible college, a man by the name of Kenny McComas was going blind. He wore glasses that looked like literally the bottom. We always called them when I was in school, Coke bottle bottoms, because they were so thick and heavy glass. And when he would read the word of God, when he would preach, and I watched him do this, he held it up like this so that he could actually read the words that were there. Because he was losing his eyesight, he memorized the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation so that he didn't have to depend on his eyesight. Imagine a preacher losing his eyesight, not being able to read the scriptures. The apostle Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, but he said, I asked God three times to take it away. And God, by the way, there's some people say God never says no. That's kind of silly, isn't it? He told Paul no three times, but he said, I got something better for you. He said, I'll give you my grace. And he got God's grace to live and not to quit. And finally, when Nero cut his head off, and before, his, before Paul's head hit the ground, he had a brand new head, God gave Paul living grace. Oh, I just can't live like this. This is so hard. Oh, yes, you can. Don't even tell me that you can. What do you mean the Christian life is so hard? You know, you just have a hard time being obedient. Don't blame it on God. He saved you. Uh, I am crucified with Christ, Brother Don. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of what? My faith? No. By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I remember many years ago you asked me about that verse, Brother Don. It remains the same. Galatians 2.20, Paul had living grace. Saving grace was one thing, but then you got to live it. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. And if you're not living it today, whose fault is that? The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Who's moved? Who moved? Who's the one that's away from God? He had saving grace. He had living grace. Something else that he had, I've only got two more. He had serving grace. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 9 and 10. He says, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, this is his Popeye moment. Say Popeye moment. Yeah, if you ever grew up on Popeye cartoons, you know what I'm talking about. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
I am what I am by the grace which was bestowed upon me, uh, not in vain, but I labored more abundantly that they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. He served God by the grace of God. You know, can I say this? It's okay to be tired in the work of God. You're not tired in the work of God. You're probably not doing much. But it is wrong to get tired of it. And that's because you serve in your flesh and the power of your flesh and not at the power of, the, of God. It's okay to be tired in it. I'm not even going to ask you who's tired today because today you got an excuse. You lost an hour of sleep last night. Uh, and that's okay to be tired. But I'm talking about where you work and you work and you work and you work and you put in hours and hours and hours and you put in weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months and, and years and years and years. And now decade upon decade. Quitters never win and winners never quit. But those who never win and never quit are idiots, I've heard said one time. But the bottom line is this. If you're tired of it, you need to get the strength to get tired in it. And that's okay. And But lastly, I want you to see this. Paul, finally, was also, he also had dying grace. He also had dying grace. He says, when do you get that? You get that when you need it. You get that when you're about to die. And nobody in this room that I know of is at that point. And well, I say, oh, I'm dying. No, you're not. You're not dead yet. If you can draw a breath, you're still alive. Hear me now. But one of these days, all of us may be on our deathbed. And I've been by many on deathbeds before. The Apostle Paul said this, and I gave these verses a moment ago, and on your way out, if you look at the plaque on the wall, you'll read part of this on there, on uh, the dedication of our ramp to Jojo. In Philippians 1, verses 20 and 21, I'm going to read them to you again, but the fact that God gave Paul dying grace. It says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing, in nothing, I shall be ashamed. Nothing. Nothing. I parse the word out. You know what nothing means? Nothing. No thing. That in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by it be by life or by what? Or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It does not say for me to live as Christ. I want you to notice that. It doesn't say that. It says for to me to live as Christ. Why? The Lord let it be individual for him because not everybody feels this way. For some, they live for them to live is money. For them to live is their job. For them to live is what they want. For them to live are their possessions. For them to live is their housing. For them to live is this. For them to live is everything else. But the Apostle Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. And then he said, while I'm alive, I live for him. And when I die, I get to see him. Wow. When I think about all the songs that Fanny Crosby wrote, over 5,000 from what I understand. I don't know what the final number was. I've never seen it. I know what I've read. I know what I've heard people say. Blind from the time she was just a little teeny tiny girl, the first face that she saw would remember, would see, would be the face of the Lord Jesus. And if you go back in our hymn book or any hymn book and look up the songs that are written by Fanny Crosby, you'll notice something, a very wonderful characteristic about all of them. Practically everything she wrote had to do with seeing Jesus or seeing light. And she had been in blindness all of her life. Grace that is, the power of God to accomplish God's will gave the Apostle Paul just exactly what he needed in order to save him from eternal hell. That's all he needed. He didn't get saved by works, not by any of those things. He got saved by God's grace. God gave him what he needed to live a life that was well-pleasing to the Lord. Don't say you can't live it. Yes, you can. For to me to live is Christ. Don't tell me you can't live it because you're struggling with obedience. You just... Remember that he gives you the faith to do so, Galatians 2.20. God gave him the grace to faithfully serve the Lord, you see. 
And then God gave him the grace to die, which is amazing. See, how do you know that? Well, he said so. But if you read Second Timothy, his last words that were written on parchment or whatever he wrote on, he said, I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. I've accomplished what God wanted me to accomplish. And he came to the end of his life and he had no regrets. What an amazing thing. So what is grace? The facet I wanted you to see today, more than anything, was that it is the power of God on your life to accomplish the will of God in your life. Telling God you can't is a slap in his face because he has grace. How do you get that grace? I remember this is back when we did Philippians back in May. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, all we have to do is go to God and ask him for it. We go to that throne of God and we get grace to help in the time of need. What a wonderful blessing that is. Now, I don't know about you. Well, I think I do know about you. I need grace. I need lots of grace. Every single day of my life, I need God's abundant grace shed upon me. And I think I speak for all of you as well. I'm sure you need it too.